Welcome back, everybody. Tuesday, February 28th. John Arvosas here with the Arvosas Report, here to talk about the latest news from Ukraine. Let me get TikTok rolling on my iPad here. And then, as always, we'll take maybe two minutes to let folks arrive. And while that's happening, introduce yourselves if you would. Here come the TikTokers. Excellent. Oh, Celia, good to see you. Oh, boy. Anyway, hey, Joe and a Mac over on TikTok. Lovely. La la la. What's going on, folks? Another gorgeous day in Washington, D.C., 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which whatever it is in Celsius is really nice. <laughs> really nice. So, up, oh, camera flip. Exactly. Camera flip, camera flip, camera flip. Boom. There we go on TikTok. Thank you for the reminder. Oh, oh thanks, Dark Phoenix. Anyway, how's folks, how's folks, how's folks doing? As always, like I said, I like to wait a minute or two just to do this. I went to Georgetown, you know, law school. Somebody's asking about law school. Law school is tough. It's very expensive. And I felt like after the first year, I kind of learned everything. And then the courses were just repetitive. I had read a wonderful essay at my uh, undergrad in Illinois, Daily Illini, 30, 40 years ago, um, that said everybody should go to law school for one year. And that's kind of the way I feel about law school. It was an excellent education for one year and it was a lot of money for three years. So, hey, Jingle, bonsoir. Anyway, guys, all right, another half minute or so and we'll dive in. Just waiting for folks to arrive. Ah, la, 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 la. Decent amount of news. Not a ton of news today. I mean, interesting news though, but uh, it's a slower news day, which is good. So I won't feel as as compelled to sort of zoom through stuff like we have the last couple of days, but um, interesting stuff nonetheless. So, all right, I can, uh, I can start rolling. So welcome everybody. I am John Aravosis. This is the Aravosis Report. Uh, this is my nightly show, Monday to Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern time U.S., where we talk about the latest news from Ukraine. And then the second half of the show or so, I take your guys' questions and comments. Uh, the best way to pose questions on TikTok is to use the Q&A button that you will find in my profile on YouTube and everywhere else. I've got you guys on my laptop. I've got TikTok on my iPad over here. For the rest of you, use the comment box at the bottom of the screen. I very much appreciate the uh, TikTok gifts and the super chat questions, super stickers on YouTube, because I do do this full time. I do do this for free. Nobody's paying me to do it except you guys. So as you know, PBS likes to say, you know, brought to you by viewers like you. So thank you for the gifts. Please keep them coming. All right. Let's just kind of roll right in here. Um, there was some kind of massive drone attack on Russia today, and it was really weird. Um, I was watching, uh, I, I didn't even sort of hear about this until I saw General Hurtling, who I really enjoy, a former American general, who was on CNN earlier today. And Hurtling says, by his count, 12 different Russian cities saw drones basically attack them today. Um, it, it's not clear how many of the drones actually attacked, meaning how many of them had bombs, how many of them reached their targets. We do know there's a couple cities, uh, I don't know if it was Krasnodar or Krasnodar or which one it was, that an oil refinery went up. Um, we know one of the cities, I think I even wrote it down, I did. One of the cities, uh, it impacted near a Gazprom facility, which is the Russian uh, you know, natural gas entity. Um, but that city was interesting because it's Gus Guba Gubastovo, I guess which is 100 kilometers or 60 miles from Moscow. That freaked the Russians out. So not only does it look like the Ukrainians coordinated a 12-city attack with drones, which is a big deal. That's a lot of coordination. But they even shot one of the drones. They got it to within 60 miles of Moscow, 100 kilometers of Moscow. Russia's defenses should have been able to discover it long before that. Thank you, Ali. Now, one a possibility that um, hurting, the hurtling, the general raised, was whether this was preparation for a larger strike, whether this was basically a trial run, and the Ukrainians were basically testing a system of launching multiple drones at once. Because think about it, if you've got 12 drones or more, you've got 12 different operators you know, working the drones. Um, could the Ukrainians be planning as part of their spring offensive some kind of massive drone attack on Russia? Who knows? Um, Pretty cool story, though. 
really freaking the Russians out. The other the reason I'm mentioning this was is interesting is because the Ukrainians were able to get drones to 12 Russian cities today simultaneously, the Russians are now being forced to beef up their air defenses at 12 different cities. That takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of manpower, a lot of equipment. And all of that is stuff, is resources that should be spent by the Russians in Ukraine. And now because of the Ukrainians, the Russians are being forced to spend the money and the resources all over Russia to protect it from Ukrainian drones. So very smart move by the Ukrainians in terms of psychologically playing games with the Russians as well. Um, Bakhmut, uh, thank you, Alan, for the meteor shower. Let's talk about Bakhmut. Um, Bakhmut is a Ukrainian town, Eastern Ukraine, about where my finger is. Um, it is the site of the biggest fighting of the last several months. So right east of Kramatorsk, right southwest of Severodonetsk. Um, it is a town that you will often hear me and others say doesn't matter. Um, it's not important strategically to the Ukrainians. Thank you, Tattooed Mom, for the, for the Christmas display. Um, it's not important to the Russians. Nonetheless, the Russians have been going crazy trying to get this town. Um, some of the thinking is that the Russians are, A, um, it's it's um, good money after bad, meaning they've wasted so much manpower. Thank you, Tattooed Mom, for the, for the seafloor. They've wasted so much manpower. They've lost so many men going after Bakhmut. They've lost so many weapons that they feel like they don't have a choice but to, to get it because if they give up now, then they lost all these men for nothing. Again, that's not a smart military reason to get it. You don't go after a town because you're embarrassed to walk away. That's stupid. Um, now, from the Ukrainian side, it gets more interesting. Um, we were talking, actually, I think just yesterday's show, just yesterday's show, we were talking about Bakhmut and what was going on. Because remember, one of the things, and I think you guys, we sort of crowdsourced it with you guys. We were trying to figure out, okay, for the Russians, maybe they're embarrassed to, you know, to give up on Bakhmut and, and the Russians need a victory. They haven't had a victory in a very long time. Even though Bakhmut is literally a town of 70,000 people, which it was before the war, it's a small, it's not even a town. It's 70,000 people. It's like a village. Um, the Russians wanted to be able to say, look, we captured a town, even though it's a town that doesn't matter. Right. But from the Ukrainian perspective, we kept asking, why are the Ukrainians like wasting so many men going after this town? That doesn't matter. And we talked about the fact, a lot of you brought up, uh, the military folks especially brought up the word attrition, basically meaning we're trying to, uh, we, the Ukrainians are trying to just slowly, slowly, slowly kill and injure and destroy Russian troops and Russian weapons in Bakhmut. They're using it as an opportunity to just keep destroying the Russians. But again, my question was, yeah, but aren't Ukrainians getting destroyed at the same time, right? Why fight? Uh, thank you, Iggy and Rebecca. Why would you fight as a Ukrainian for a town that doesn't matter? Well, it looks like we've got our answer today. Very interesting. So CNN reported on this. And CNN talked to Ukrainian troops who said, um, I forget the exact quote, um, basically that the, the situation in Bakhmut is much worse than is being reported. And what they mean by that is, um, you know, the situation is much more grave than is being reported for Ukraine, okay? Things aren't going well in Bakhmut. But it is true, the Russians are advancing slowly. The Russians have not advanced fully yet. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, eventually, eventually, as things currently stand, eventually it looks like the Ukrainians will probably have to pull out. But listen to what the Ukrainian troops told CNN. This I thought was, was beautiful. Thank you, Six Sauer. As far as explaining why the Ukrainians keep trying to defend a town that isn't strategically important. Thank you, Marcy. Listen to this quote. We all, <laughs> thank you, Betty. We all understand that we are holding on and dying to win time for a counteroffensive in the spring. Okay, let me read this again. We are holding on and dying to win time for a counteroffensive in the spring. What that suggestion is, is that the Ukrainians know the town doesn't matter. For whatever crazy reason, the Russians want it. Okay, A. B. Generally speaking, when you are defending an area, it is much easier to defend than to attack, especially a city, right? So because you can hide in buildings, you can do all sorts of things. So it should be expected the Russians are losing more troops than the Ukrainians are losing in fighting this battle in Bakhmut. So for example, the Russians could be losing five troops to every one troop the Ukrainians lose, for example, something like that, right? So if you're Ukrainian, your calculus there is, okay, we're losing men, but they're losing way more men than we are. Let's keep 
attrition. Let's keep hurting their troops, right? Thank you, Iggy, for that. But this quote's a little different, which I think is interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. They want to um, win time for a counteroffensive in the spring. Thank you, Eugene, for that too. What I think they're saying is, if, if Ukraine were to give up Bakhmut, because look, it doesn't matter to Ukraine, why fight, why lose men over a town that doesn't matter? If Russia matters, Russia keeps sending more troops there. Russia keeps sending its best troops there. Russia keeps sending more equipment there. Russia is hell-bent on winning Bakhmut. What does that mean? Those troops that are fighting in Bakhmut can't go anywhere else right now because they're fighting in Bakhmut. Thank you, Betty. So what Ukraine is doing is, in preparation for Ukraine's own counteroffensive that they want to do this spring, okay? And by counteroffensive, we mean it looks like the Russian offensive began a few weeks ago. In other words, the big Russian attack. Um, the Ukrainians are planning their own attack, their big counterattack, thank you, Rowan, sometime this spring. In preparation for it, the Ukrainians, I'm, I'm trying to explain this, you know, I'm trying to explain this sort of well. It is better for the Ukrainians to tie the Russians up in Bakhmut. I'll give you an example. Let's pretend the Ukrainians in the middle of April want to attack Zaporizhia. Let's let's pretend the big plan, because this is one of the possibilities, is that the Ukrainians want to come in, take Zaporizhia, and this would cut the Russian territory in half. This currently is the Russian territory, the, the territory the Russians hold in Ukraine. So you could imagine if the Ukrainians come here, it cuts off this part of Russia, Ukraine, this part of Russian troops from this part of Russian troops, that helps the Ukrainians a lot. It makes it really harder for the Russians to resupply each other, right? So let's say mid-April, the, the Ukrainians want to go here. Currently, the Russians are, are sending the, the majority of their troops, their best troops, up here. Ukraine would rather keep these Russian troops occupied here until the Ukrainians are ready for their big offensive down here. Because if the Ukrainians give up now, all the Russian troops that are here can move and start fighting somewhere else. And then what happens? The Russians decide to pick an area that's more important, and the Ukrainians now have a choice. Either the Ukrainians do their plan in Zaporizhia, or they've got to go and fight the Russian troops somewhere else. The idea is, and again, I may not be explaining this well, but the Ukrainians are basically locking the Russians in place, pending the Ukrainian counterattack, because they're afraid if they don't lock them in, the Russians will basically attack somewhere else, and it could it could move the Ukrainians to have to focus on something else, and they don't want to do that. So it's very interesting. I mean, it's very, it's, 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 let me put it this way as a conclusion. Not surprisingly, it seems that the Ukrainians know what they're doing. Um, you know, while the, while the Russians are playing checkers, the Ukrainians are playing chess, that they're planning ahead and they're planning for their spring offensive and thinking, how does this battle right now affect our spring attack? Very smart of the Ukrainians. Um, a quick little other story. Putin signed a law today suspending participation in the New START Treaty. That's one of the arms control treaties. Uh, thank you. It's, it's, it's the arms control treaty that we have right now with the Russians. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, Putin had mentioned a couple days ago, remember, and Betty, uh, had mentioned a couple days ago that they were going to suspend their participation. It was kind of all over the place. Thank you for the gift, Rebecca. Uh, remember, they were sort of, first they said, we're pulling out of the treaty. Then they said, we're not pulling out of the treaty. Then they said, we're suspending our participation, but we're still going to obey the treaty limits on how many nuclear weapons we can have. So the Russians were kind of all over the place. Well, Putin signed a law today or whatever, suspending Russia's participation in the treaty. Now, the thing is, sip of water. Once again, everything with Russia is drama and psychological warfare. This, to me, is more of, thank you, Joy, more of Putin playing games with nuclear weapons. Putin's trying to scare you. He's trying to scare every single one of you and every single one of me <laughs> um, into thinking, oh my God, I, the Russian trolls on TikTok already. I was, I was noticing as I was, as I was talking, we had a number of Russian trolls come and say, oh, there's going to be a nuclear war. There's going to be a nuclear war. That's all they've got. Um, they're losing this war. Granted, Ukraine, no, I will say Ukraine could still lose the war. Okay. I mean, this is not a done deal. We have to keep supporting Ukraine. We've got to give them better support. Either side could lose, but Russia ain't doing well in this war and they know they're not doing well. The only way Russia can win this war is by convincing us to leave. One of the ways Russia is trying to convince us to leave is to convince us that, oh my God, there's going to be a nuclear war and you know, we better stop. Well, those of us who know 
I would say there are some, I would say there are, le- there are legitimate people who are certainly worried about the nuclear threat. Thank you, Rebecca. I am not personally. Um, I think it's BS. I think, uh, I think of, of, uh, okay, exactly. Blue 442 just said on TikTok, nobody wins a nuclear war. And the thing is, Russia knows that. Okay. We know that we know. I mean, quite literally, it's not, by the way, it's not just some uh, platitude. Nobody wins a nuclear war. It's literal. If we launch nukes against Russia, they will launch nukes against us. We all die. If Russia, la- if Russia were to launch nukes against us, we would launch ours against them. We all die. So neither side is ever going to use their nuclear weapons unless it is literally a doomsday scenario. I'm talking, you know, the Russians are, the Russian troops are approaching Washington, D.C. And rather than give up America, we nuke Russia, right? Or vice versa. Our troops are approaching the Kremlin in Moscow, right? Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Um, but if you're Putin, what do you then do? You've got all these nuclear weapons that you know you can't use. Because if Putin uses his nukes, we use our nukes. So what do you do? Well, you threaten the nukes, right? You threaten them. You try to convince America that you would use the nukes. Now, the way the Russians are doing it is by always talking about the nukes. Thank you, Rebecca. One of them in particular who always makes me laugh, um, he's reported to be an alcoholic, is uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who was the former Russian president back in the 2000s. He was considered the sane um, liberal, but in the sense of uh, not, uh, I'm not sure what word to use when I say liberal, but meaning, um, because I know the Brits use it differently. Uh, Let's say modern. He was considered a modern kind of Russian politician, somebody who was more open to the West. Well, he's gone nutsy cuckoo. He talks all the time about nuclear weapons every day from this guy. Thank you, Aggie. Every day from this guy, literally, I mean, literally several times a week, this guy threatens us with nuclear weapons. Okay. Thank you, Aggie. And uh, who is that inspired woman? Oh, and Pishka. Um, so if you're Russia, I'll put a finer point on him. If you're Russia and you know you've got all these nukes and you can't use them because America will use this nukes in your turn, all you can do is threaten them. So P- Putin has been threatening nukes nonstop, hoping that people who aren't like me who do this for a living sit there and go, oh my God, the Russians just threatened to nuke us. Isn't that dangerous? Isn't that bad? Because most people, most people, and it's not your fault. I mean, thank you, Rebecca. Um, most people don't know that France and the UK, for example, in addition to America, have nuclear submarines. On those nuclear submarines, we've got nuclear missiles. Those nuclear missiles, by the way, can destroy Russia. Those nuclear missiles are impossible to find. Thank you, Five Boys Dad. They are impossible to find. It's it's next to impossible to find a sub underwater. Our nuclear subs would survive a nuclear war. And what would happen is we would then attack Russia and destroy Russia. That's But most people don't necessarily know that. So most people hear Russia threaten and they go, Russia's threatened to use their nukes. Maybe they will. Maybe this Ukraine thing's gone too far, right? Thank you, Steve. Any case, um, so that's sort of my general point. I think Putin is making these comments. Thank you, Brojo. <laughs> Brojo, that's cute. I think Putin is making these comments about, you know, we are suspending the nuclear weapons treaty because it's just another way to threaten nukes to America and to the West. Thank you, Jean Marquis. I appreciate that. That's very pretty. Um, it's just another way to make us think, oh my God, nuclear weapons, it's so dangerous. Now, the other point I would say is Russia is threatening America with a nuclear arms race? Russia? I mean, we did this before. We did this before with the Soviet Union. Last time we won, okay? (laughs) We won the arms race last time. It was very expensive, but we won. Russia has even less money now. Russia is a much more poor country in terms of, it's just a smaller country, um, much smaller economy. Thank you there. Who is that, Zuli, for that? Um, The idea that they're going to, you know, start a new arms race with the West. All I can think of, all I can think of is these threats from Russia, they make sense if Putin's doing it for a domestic audience. Because I think his domestic people, you know, they live in a dictatorship. They're not getting full information. So maybe for them, it kind of makes sense. You know, thank you, Tiger and Bonnie for the gifts. Maybe it makes sense to them. Um, that, that, that Putin says these things, but to the rest of us, w- w- we know better. I mean, again, they're going to have, Russia's going to have an arms race with us with, with whose money? Seriously. Um, 
All right, let me do a quick little uh, pitch for my Discord, and then we'll go on with the rest of the news. Um, I do have a Discord set up. It's discords.aravosis.com. It and all of my links you can find in my profile on TikTok. You'll see the link tree link. That link takes you to my link of my page of links for the rest of you, aravosis.com. Um, thank you, Happy Beach. The neat thing about the Discord is it's a nice chat community, but we have a lot of cool auctions we do there. Now, the auctions are 50% to help Ukraine and 50% to help me because I do this full time. I do it for free. Thank you, Rebecca. And quite literally, the people who pay my salary are you guys. Thank, thank you, Dawn, for that. You make it possible for me to do this every day, full time. So I appreciate that. Um, with the the Discord, we've got cool auctions set up. Um, just to tell you really quick, we've the, and I'm showing. I know I do this every night, but it's the last night because it's the last box. We're auctioning off several different things right now. One of them is this box of Russian fighter jet parts, a Russian fighter jet that was shot down over Ukraine. Um, very cool titanium titanium uh, pieces of the plane. Totally freaking cool. We know who the pilot is. We know what the plane is. We've got all the information. It's really freaking cool. That's being auctioned. Um, another thing, we've got these really cool, oops, knocking my jacket on the floor. This really cool um, Zelensky sweatshirt. These are the sweatshirts that, oops, these are the sweatshirts that Zelensky wears that are totally cool. Um, love those. Um, oops. Those are, the, those are the actual sweatshirts that he wear. We found the company and bought them. We're auctioning those. Um, I've got something else. Oh, I've got something else I forgot. But then what I finally started auctioning off, is those of you guys who've been following me for months will remember this. Months ago, we got a number of drawings from kids in Ukraine, high school kids, excuse me, no, excuse me, grade school kids in Ukraine, young kids who drew pictures for the troops, for their own troops. And the schools sent us a bunch of them that we've been using on our t-shirts. So I've got a number of t-shirts at our uh, store over at, uh, whatchamacallit, you can find it store.aravosis.com. You can find it via my links, my link in my profile, my link there. And I would say one of our two most popular t-shirts is this design. I'm finally auctioning off this design. This is the original design done by the Ukrainian kid. Uh, her name is uh, Yana. Yana. She's in the fifth grade. It's because it says on the bottom, Yana, fifth grade. Um, it says Slava Ukraini in the corner, which is really cute. You can see Slava Ukraini. And at the bottom, ugh, I've got the bottom translated, but it's something, ugh, I'm forgetting now. Um, ugh, what? Help me out. I don't have it in front of me. Ukrainians who Ukrainians with me out there. What's the bottom say again? Somebody who speaks Ukrainian. I'm forgetting the very bottom part. Oop. Well, if any of you speak Ukrainian, put what it is really quick, but I've got to trans. Anyway, we're auctioning these things off too, which I love this. So this is the, this is the original from the little girl, which I just think is totally cool. So uh, go check out our discord and, um, and join us and help support my work, help keep doing this. And you guys, um, fabulous. Anyway, thank you. All right, let's keep going here. Take care. There you go. It says, take care of yourself and come back alive. Whoa, big drama. What in God's name is that? Whoa. Okay. That was one of the coolest gifts we've ever had on TikTok. Wow. Was that a Phoenix or what was that? So I'm trying to see really quick. It usually says what it is. It, it went by too fast. Um, it was a Phoenix. Oh my God. That was cool. That, sorry, but that was, I, I like to take a break and thank the TikTok people occasionally for their gifts because some of them are so freaking cool. That was very cool. Thank you, Big Drama. That, I mean, that was very generous of you, but that was also very cool. I mean, I like the gifts because they help support my work, but also I think it's kind of cool for folks to basically, I think for you guys, it's kind of fun to have cool gifts come across too. So thank you for the audience as well, sharing something like that, because I know for TikTokers, it's kind of cool to see the cool stuff too. That was really nice of you. Thank you. Um, Roshan, I was just going to say, I thought B. Smith had a question that maybe didn't get in the first thing. B. Smith is asking a super chat question on TikTok, on YouTube, excuse me. And I like to, uh, super chat, super chat questions are the questions you pay for on YouTube. So I like to get to those immediately as a thank you for folks supporting my work. Uh, B. Smith is saying, I heard rumors that the Russians are considering using chemical and biological weapons in Ukraine. If they do, how will NATO respond? Um, what B. Smith is probably talking about, thank you, Bonnie, for that. There was a weird story in the last day or two. 
And I will tell you, I'm only finding this story in the Daily Beast and then alternative news sources. I'm not finding it in mainstream Western news sources. And that's one of the first thing that always gives me a little pause. You know, I don't like it. If you can't find, if the New York Times, the Washington Post and others, you know, BBC aren't covering a story, at, at least it should give you pause. What supposedly happened in the last couple of days was a uh, former American ambassador to Russia. Thank you, Benny, Betty, Betty for that. Uh, former American ambassador to Russia said that he believes Russia is going to use chemical weapons in Ukraine. Uh, and maybe biological, but chemical. The Russians then turned around and said, aha, the Americans are accusing us of preparing to use chemical weapons. It's because the Americans are preparing to use chemical weapons and we're gonna we're gonna find the scoundrel that's doing this. Give me a break. Um, that now th there may have been some other things, but that's the story I saw today. Um, initially, I was worried until I saw it was the Russians responding to us, supposedly. So because the thing you always worry about with Russia, is false flag operations. In other words, Russia accuses us of something they're preparing to do. Um, and they're very good at that. And it basically means, um, for example, if Russia says Ukraine is getting ready to use chemical weapons, we would be very worried that Russia was about ready to use chemical weapons. Okay. Because basically they're accusing us so that they could then do it and go, aha, look, somebody used chemical weapons. We warned you. It must have been, must have been Ukraine. In this case, I'm less worried because the situation is that it looks like an American first said he was worried about Russia and then Russia responded. Now, generally speaking, you know, we should be worried about the potential. Um, I've said before, unfortunately, chemical and biological weapons are not the same thing as nuclear weapons. And when I say unfortunately, I mean in terms of the psychological impact. The psychological impact of using nukes would be tremendous in terms of if Russia did that. The psychological impact on the world of using chemical or biological weapons would be horrific. And I'd be very curious to see what NATO does, but I have a feeling that NATO would do much more in response to a nuclear weapon being used than a chemical or biological. Even biological area of all these children and everything with, um, you know, with the chemical attacks there. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if NATO would respond differently than they would to nuclear. Um, what also worries me is I'm, I got to tell you, I know the administration talks a lot, the Biden administration about, you know, there will be serious consequences if Russia uses a nuke. But part of me wonders, will there be, <laughs> you know, um, I just, I, I, I sense a fear. I sense a fear factor with these guys. And I, I just don't know. I mean, the the generals on the outside are the ones that are saying, um, you know, the former American generals are the ones that are saying we need to bomb Sevastopol, the Russian naval base in Crimea, which is all the way down here. OK, I remember Crimea, Crimea, the territory the Russians stole from Ukraine in 2014. So one of the plans that was put out there by a former American general was to bomb the naval base here. Another one is to hit Russian troops all over Ukraine and bomb them. I've talked about putting a, a true no fly zone over Ukraine if this happens. But but these are also the same generals who say Ukraine needs fighter jets. Ukraine needs long range missiles. They are the generals who say Ukraine needs all the stuff the Biden administration doesn't want to give them. The Biden administration is afraid to give them. So I don't know. I, I just, and I'll say this, like I, I am, you know this, anybody who's watching, I am not an anti-Biden guy. I think Biden's done an amazing job with this war, but I think Putin is inside Biden's head and Putin scares Biden and Biden's scared of him and Biden pulls punches to, 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 because he's afraid of making Putin angry. Thank you, Zoe. And I worry that if Biden is afraid of making Putin angry by giving Ukraine MiG fighter jets or longer range missiles, why is Biden going to go and blow up an entire Russian military base if they use a nuke? I mean, he should go and blow up an entire Russian military base if they use a nuke, but is he? Hmm, I don't know. And, and by the way, that's the best way to get Russia to use nukes or to use biological or chemical weapons is for them to think that, hey, maybe we'd get away with it. Maybe America wouldn't come down on us like a ton of bricks. It, it worries me. Um, 
Vladimir Zelensky. So uh, I mentioned a couple days ago that Zelensky had fired um, one of his top uh, military commanders. And we were kind of surprised about it because, hang on, sip of water. Um, because he didn't give any reason behind it. He just fired the guy. And we know in the last couple of weeks, Zelensky's fired a lot of his, um, not a lot, but several top people in his administration. Thank you, Betty, for the origami. Um, people in his, in his administration because of corruption. Now, there was an analyst on Sky News today, Sean Bell, who's one of their military analysts. And he simply, he thinks, he thinks Zelensky may have fired this commander in order to generate some fresh ideas a year into the war, which I thought was interesting because to me, I'd hear somebody say generate fresh ideas and I go, come on, that sounds ridiculous. Um, but this guy's a military analyst with Sky News. I've seen his name pop up before. And apparently it's not unheard of a year into the war to replace some of your top people. Again, I don't know. I'll ask the military folks out there. To me, it still sounds a little, a little sketchy, <laughs> you know, because as we've talked about with Russia, every time they change their top commanders, it just kind of messes everything up. You know, the people below aren't sure what's going on. It just, you know, it, anyway, thank you for the gift there. Who was that? Sherwood. Um, what else we got? Oh, the AWACS. So that plane, we talked the other day about Belarus and a plane that the Ukrainians or, or Belarusian partisans, basically uh, Belarusians who are working on behalf of Ukraine, uh, attacked the other day. Now, Ukraine map, Russia all the way over here, Belarus is up here, Poland and the rest of NATO down here, okay, and up here too. Belarus is over here. Belarus is a dictatorship run by a nasty guy named Lukashenko who uh, arrived in China today for a state visit. And I think it's, I forget the military base, I think it's near Minsk. The Belarusian partisans, there are partisans, um, basically, Belarusian citizens who are like as, as part of a secret organization. I wouldn't say terrorist, but you could call them terrorists if you wanted to, um, in a sense, good terrorists, <laughs> but a, a secret organization that is trying to make things harder for the Russian occupation. Resistance, yep, resistance. They've been blowing up train lines, for example, which make it harder for the Russians to move their troops and move their equipment through Belarus. Well, supposedly Saturday or Sunday, I think it was Sunday, the Belarusian partisans claim that they attacked a Russian AWACS plane. The AWACS planes are those aerial surveillance planes, like a 747 or whatever, that have that big thing sticking out the top and the big pancake, like the big circle, like a UFO sticking out the top of it, which is its radar. That's the AWACS plane. Um, they claim they damaged it. They claim they put it out of commission. Nobody knows if it's true or not. Today, literally right before the show, I saw uh, a satellite image. They found a satellite image of the plane that appears to show marks on the plane, right? The question is, are the marks from damage? What are they? We're not sure. Um, the British Ministry of Defense weighed in and said that attribution and damage has not been officially corroborated, so we still don't know yet whether they hit it. However, the loss of an A-50 mainstay would be significant as it is critical to Russian air operations for providing an air battlefield picture. This will likely leave six operational A-50s, the plane, in service, further constraining Russian air operations. So if they did this, it's a big deal in terms of how it sets Russia back and, again, helps Ukraine for the coming spring offensive. Um, another hack. So this was, this is one of those stories where I don't know whether to laugh or get a little bit scared, but it seems that I'm going to guess the Ukrainians, but who knows, hacked Russia again and hacked the Russian civil defense infrastructure. Listen to this. This is um, from Sky News. Um, Russian television and radio channels have been hacked and air raid sirens heard in several areas of the country this morning. This is today. An air raid alert was broadcast and people were told to immediately shelter from an incoming missile attack in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Zverdlovsk, and Belgorod during the uh, during the hack which reported which reportedly lasted around 10 minutes. The annexed area of Crimea was also included in the ha the hack attack. Regional television, listen to this. Regional television in Russia showed a symbol of a man running for cover from missiles 
while radio stations played a siren with a message which stated, attention, attention, an air raid alert is being issued. Everybody head to shelters now. Attention, attention, missile threat. You know, I'm very divided on this because, you know, my human side loves this, absolutely thinks it's hilarious. My uh, my more intellectual side worries that you are convincing the Russians that they're under attack. And my concern would be I wouldn't want Russian military people to think they're under attack. You know what I mean? You wouldn't want somebody to do something stupid. They think missiles are coming in and they launch a missile back, right? Or something like that. That That's my one fear with that. Um, I will say something like this happened the other day. Uh, we think the Ukrainians, again, it was uh, just for radio stations and people had recorded it with their phone, Russia's, and put it online. And they were Russian radio stations broadcasting their civil defense warning that missiles were incoming. Um, it is... It is certainly, um, it's good psychological warfare because it freaks the hell out of the Russian people. Once again, the idea here, I mean, this is this would be in the plus column of why you do it. You want to scare the Russian people and make this a real war for them. This is not a real war for the Russian people. Sure, you know, they're starting to know people who have died or people who have been injured. The Ukrainians are watching their country be destroyed. Russia's not, right? Russia is not watching anything be destroyed. It is good if the Russian people start to freak out a little bit and start worrying about what's happening. And this kind of thing would unsettle them and freak them out. That's good. Um, Secondly, just like the story I told you at the top of the show of Ukraine sending apparently 12 drones today to 12 different Russian cities, that has a wonderful psychological impact. It freaks the Russians out, but it freaks the Russian military and it freaks the Russian government out because Putin sees that his own air defense isn't very good at this. Or in this case, Putin sees that his own government is being hacked by somebody on the outside. And by the way, the fact that a missile alert could be generated by a hack means if there were a missile alert, a real one, you get a boy that cried wolf situation where the Russian people could sit there and say, thank you, Louis, for that. The Russian people could sit there and say, you know, yeah, we get those all the time. Those are those hacks. And all of a sudden it's a real missile alert and you're not defended. So from a Russian military perspective, this is not a good thing. By the way, somebody in the Russian military is, you know, taking a trip off a balcony today, I think, as a result of this. This is the second time this has happened, folks. Somebody is losing their job, if not worse, I think. So again, for those reasons, I think it's a good thing. I still do think you're playing with fire a little bit, playing with missile warnings, you know, but there you go. A couple more stories. I also have a Patreon set up. If you guys can check it out, I appreciate it. Thank you. Who was that? I, we, and (laughs) Yahoo for the hat and mustache and truthful for the cap. Um, That up, it's Paravosis. You can find the link in my profile. You guys can find it at aravosis.com. Basically, Patreon is a really neat way that you can help uh, creators of of stuff like I do by giving them a a contribution every month. Quite simply. Thank you, Inspired, for the gift there. And Annie, um, (laughs) that rose always cracks me up. It's like this little rose in your mouth. Thank you, Killers, for the hat. Um, It's a a way of giving a a, a gift every month, basically. Five bucks, 10 bucks, 25 bucks. Um, But it's just, just a nice way. Thank you, Betty. Of for a creator of sort of knowing how much is coming in each month, which is really nice. Thank you, Riverside. But the gifts are really nice too. So I appreciate those as well. So again, it's patreon.com slash aerovosis. And if you contribute $5 or more on Patreon, thank you, L. You can link it to the Discord. Thank you, Sander, for that, and Heather. You can link it to the Discord, and you become a VIP member of our Discord, which means you get to you get to bid in the VIP auction and other benefits, depending on uh, how much you're putting. But frankly, it's just about supporting my work. So thank you. I appreciate it, guys. Um, I know TikTok, unfortunately, TikTok only has 30 days left. That could be true, Jennifer. Or who is that, Jeff? <laughs> I thought about that. Thank you, Loyalty for the Rose. I've been getting a little bit worried about the TikTok. I mean, it's worth talking about briefly, but you know, we're joking, but we're not joking. Um, there is concern that China may provide Russia uh, lethal weapons in Ukraine. If that happens, the administration came out today, Biden, and said they're going to go after Chinese companies. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a little worried that we're going to lose our TikTok if that happens. I hope not. I hope not. Um, I will say this. <laughs> Check out my YouTube. 
check out my my uh my discord <laughs> make sure make sure you got a backup tiktokers i'd hate to lose you guys you can find all of those links in my profile anyway the, the link in my profile click it you'll find my youtube you'll find everything there all right let's keep going here um this i've got oh i've got two more stories the chairman of russia's human rights council has called for a new law that would criminalize russophobia the story went on and I just couldn't, I just couldn't with the rest of this. The Russians have coined a word because the Russians, supremely homophobic country, supremely and homophobic by official policy. Now, my own country has problems with this too, obviously, but not as bad as Russia. Russia's really bad. And the government loves to bash gay people and they love, love, love to bash trans people. Again, not unique to Russia. We got problems here in America too. Um, but the, they, they, for Putin to coin the word Russophobia, he loves because he hates the word homophobia, right? It came up with this word. I, when I started noticing it when the war broke out a year ago, that every time we would do something, we'd give weapons to Ukraine or whatever, the Russian government would say, that's Russophobia. And basically anything we accuse the Russians of is because we have an unnatural fear of all things Russian. And it's like, dude, come on. You know, the reason people don't like your country is because people have studied history and they know for 300 years, you guys have been just kind of a nasty dictatorship type country, but also for the last nearly hundred years, actually over a hundred years ago, thank God it stopped 30 years ago, but for 70 years, the Soviet Union terrorized half of your, terrorized the world but held half of Europe captive. Russia had a secret pact with Stalin. Russia, after World War II, ate up half of Europe and took it hostage. These people lived under some of the worst dictatorships that you could imagine in the world. I mean, East Germany, the police state that was East Germany. Romania? I mean, horrific. Some of these countries these people lived in, what the, what the police did, and they did it on behalf of Russia and the Soviets. So when the Russians talk about Russophobia, there's a reason. Honestly, all you have to do is read the news about Ukraine and you will understand why my generation and a lot of other people have a real problem with Russia because we watched what the Soviets did to people back in my, in my case, the 1970s, the 1980s. I watched what Russia did and um, they're doing, it's the same thing they're doing to Ukraine now. But I also have to laugh because I also mentioned this story because it's an example of how bad the Russians are at messaging. The idea that, we're going to pass a law banning Russophobia. What the hell does that mean, right? <laughs> I mean, like, what does that even mean? You know, you're going to make it illegal for me to do my TikTok because I criticize your genocide? I mean, it's just, it reminds me like a little kid. It just, you know what I mean? Like, you're Russophobic. No, I'm not. You are. It's just, ugh, it's just little children. Um, CNN says that uh, the U.S. has found no evidence of any weapons procured by the Americans and given to Ukraine that had been found outside of Ukraine. This was an argument a lot of the, you know, the, the pro-Putin folks were, were alleging that the weapons we were giving Ukraine were somehow going all over the world. They're not. Um, and finally, this is really neat. I grabbed the quick, I put it on my TikTok, but I think I've got it here. Um, Pro-Ukrainian activists in Crimea, and remember, Crimea is the uh, territory in southern Ukraine that the Russians stole in 2014. You know how the Russians have been drawing that Z? And who knows why? But it's their sort of their, their symbol of the war is a Z. And for a lot of us, we thought, you know, the Z looks like half of a swastika. I mean, it's literally half of a swastika, practically. It, it didn't really make sense why why you would do, as far as marketing goes, not a great marketing plan to come up, not to mention Z, part of the word Nazi, everything about it was a stupid idea. Nonetheless, the Russians engrave it everywhere. They even, I saw a video the other day, they engraved it on the nose of a, of a Ukrainian dog. They literally took a knife and carved it into the poor dog's nose. I mean, really sick stuff. Well, Ukrainian activists or, or Crimean activists have been running around Crimea. And let me show you this. And they have been taking the Z and finishing it and making it into an hourglass, okay? So you can see, I'll show you uh, both of these here. You can see the hourglass, I'll show you guys. See, so, so it was a Z, they're making it an hourglass. They're putting, oops, that would be my video. They're putting the colors of the Ukrainian flag, blue and yellow. And it. the point is, 
it means it's an hourglass. It means time is up. Your time is running out. I love that. I mean, again, first of all, taking, taking a symbol, making it something else, making it look Ukrainian is great with the colors, but also the symbol that your time is running out is freaking brilliant because it's also an ominous kind of threat against the Russian troops, which is brilliant. Um, anyway, had to share that. I just thought that was really very cool of the Ukrainians to do. Very creative. Um, and finally, we do have a store as well, store.erevosis.com. We've got a lot of t-shirts and uh, hoodies and things, uh, Ukrainian designs and all of that. And half of the proceeds from that also go to help Ukraine. Half of it goes to help my work. Thank you, Hazel, for that. All right, guys, let's do our Q&A. I said we didn't have much news. And of course, I went late again. What do you do? Um, now, I know that would be cool on a show. Actually, that Poppy... Poppy, Timothy O'Leary had an idea. He said, put that on a shirt. That's an interesting idea. Actually, that wouldn't take much of it. I shouldn't speak for Poppy here because she does. she's done wonderful designs for us. But that wouldn't take as much of a design, would it, necessarily? She said, I'm on it. <laughs> Poppy, Wendy, did a number of our cool, like the pickle, the pickle, the pickle throwing shirt. Um, Russia is losing dude. She did a number of the really cool designs we've got in the, uh, in the, in the store, which you can find via erovosis.com and our store. You can find via the link in the profile. All right, let's do Q and a here. Um, did Moldova request UN peacekeeping troops today? I did not see that. If they did, I didn't see it. Um, so I don't know, but did not see that. Um, in other words, it wasn't sort of popping up at the top of the news of anything I was reading, which makes me think if they did, you know, you'd think they would. Um, all right, let me find. Here we go. Q&A. So, yeah, on TikTok, remember, you can submit questions via the Q&A link in my profile. The rest of you can use the comment box at the bottom. Um, do, 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 do. I did talk about the hacking of the Russian public alert system. You missed it. We did. We talked about it earlier. I said it was, excuse me, it was very cool, but also a little scary. Um, um, oh, that was fun. Yeah. The subscribers, I forgot. Somebody said, talk about how the subscribers on TikTok got to talk with Vlad on Saturday. That's true. TikTok, Saturday morning, we had our TikTok, uh, just as a thank you, as a number of different ways of basically financing what I'm doing here. As I said, I do it full time. Nobody's paying me. You, I mean, you guys pay me. Nobody's paying me otherwise to do this. Um, uh, one of the ways is TikTok has paid subscribers and we've got like 130 or something. It's not bad. I mean, it's, it's actually a nice number. And, you know, I get a portion of the money, TikTok gets some of the money, you know, that's the way it is. But it's actually not bad money. And as a thank you for the paid subscribers, people on TikTok will know because you see SNN sort of next to the person's name, kind of in burnt red. That means they're a paid subscriber. Um, I can have uh, uh, TikTok live videos like this just for the paid subscribers. So I do that every Saturday morning just for fun for like half an hour, maybe a little bit longer. PB and J had a question. Okay, I'll try to find it. Um, and this time Vlad was around. Vlad's my friend in Ukraine who basically is our contact on the ground uh, doing all the fundraising with us. And he's the he's the contact, he's the volunteer. Well, volunteer. They call everybody volunteers over there, but he's working with the nonprofit, with the charity that we're doing all of our work with. And uh, Vlad was able to come on and do audio with us for about half hour, 45 minutes, just talking about what was going on there and everything. And it was fun. It was fun. We had a lot of fun, but it was sort of a, it was a nice, it was like a nice sort of opportunity for folks. Um, so PP and J had a question here. Reinforcement of the armed forces of Ukraine. Oh, I meant to mention that today and I didn't. You are correct. Um, Ukraine said today that they are sending reinforcements to Bakhmut. They're going to send more of their troops to Bakhmut, the area, the, the town in eastern Ukraine where all the, when the major fighting is going on. Um, the decision to hold the city is a strategic, not political one, Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine. But again, that makes sense because a political decision would be stupid as far as I'm concerned. I mean, yes, there is a political component. Um, actually, Admiral Hurtling talked about this today, former U.S., uh, excuse me, General Hurtling, former U.S. General. And he was asked about it and he said, yeah, there's a, I don't, I don't know that he used the word political, but meaning there's a morale element to it, right? Um, if you hold a town that helps your morale, if you lose a town that hurts your morale. So there's that kind of an element to it. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, but, uh, and I think he talked about it more from a war of attrition. In other words, I think the decision isn't really political as much as it is strategic. You don't, you don't fight this 
heavily in a town that doesn't matter unless you've got a good military reason for doing so. A political reason for doing so is stupid. That's what the Russians are doing. The Russians are fighting for a political reason. They're fighting because if they leave now, they're going to look stupid because they've lost literally thousands of men have died in that town. I think like 5,000 Russians, the number was horrible. The number of Russian troops who have died trying to win this town that doesn't matter. You're going to look horrible and it's going to hurt the Russian government actually if they pull out. I mean, they could lose their jobs. Nonetheless, Thank you, Hazel, for the whale. We've got a we've got a whale on TikTok. It will do the wave. Thank you guys for that. Um, I understand why Putin is making it political because Putin doesn't want to lose his job or worse <laughs> by losing Bakhmut and looking like yet again they can't even win a small town. But to me, that's not a reason you fight. I mean, I am not a military guy. I'm a foreign policy guy. Okay, but nonetheless. You are, you know, my training is in how governments work, how governments should think about things. Governments should not be making decisions because you're trying to save the job of the president. That's stupid. That's just freaking stupid to me. Um, and that's what I think Putin is doing. So for the Ukrainians to be sending more troops, they shouldn't be sending it for political reasons. They should be sending it for strategic reasons, meaning we've got a strategy here of how this is going to help us later on. So that makes sense to me, PBNJ. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, oh, Ben, I see you got something here. Let me find it. Thank you, Ben, for that. Um, Ben asks, did you see that a Chinese company provided the Wagner group with satellite imagery and intelligence? I saw that. I didn't get to, um, reading more about it. The story I was reading was very quick and simply said that. And I was like, okay, Chinese company provided the Wagner group, which is the mercenary group, the Russian mercenary group. Uh, fighting in Bakhmut, especially, or they were fighting in Bakhmut. The, the Putin may have removed them um, with satellite imagery. What I don't know is, again, what does that mean? Are these Chinese satellites providing information? I mean, like what, I wasn't sure what that, it doesn't sound good, obviously, but I wasn't sure what it meant in terms of the, the strategic impact. You know what I mean? Was the Chinese government, I, I just don't know. And, and, what is Wagner Group getting from the Chinese company that it's not getting from the Russian government? I mean, that's interesting right there. Why would they have to go to a Chinese company? Doesn't Russia have enough satellites, right? But it's interesting, right? I mean, what, what are the Chinese have? I mean, not to mention, I mean, Ukraine's on the border with Russia. You'd think Russia would have pretty good satellite coverage of its own border, and they wouldn't have to turn to the Chinese half a globe away. Um, any case... I saw it, but I wasn't quite sure what the impact was, so I, I didn't bring it up. But yeah, it's interesting. And again, it sort of it sort of suggests the Chinese, you know, the Russians may not have all the information they need. Um, Putin was in the East Germanys in the 80s. That is correct. Um, let me uh, de -de 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 find another question here. Ooh, I shouldn't be yawning. I actually had a decent night's sleep last night. I shouldn't be yawning. Um, my thoughts about TikTok being banned in the U.S. We talked about that earlier. My thoughts about that are, don't forget to join me on YouTube <laughs> and Discord. I've got a Discord set up. You can find all of my links in my profile on TikTok. That's my thoughts. No, I, you know, I mean, I will admit, I don't know enough about the concerns about TikTok to have a real opinion. I mean this. Um, it is. It there is a lot of really complicated stuff as to what TikTok is or isn't doing behind the scenes on our phones. I know a lot of uh, U.S. government types are very concerned about it. They could be overreacting, but maybe not. Right. So um, clearly, it's a Chinese company, right? In China, it, China is a communist country. It's not like companies exist <laughs> independent of the government. I mean, they don't. I mean, they do, but they don't. You know what I mean? They just don't. Um, so should you, should you worry that there's an app that might be tied to the Chinese government on your phone? Yeah, you know, it worries me. Um, having said that, it's my business. I also think TikTok has gotten so big and so influential that you kind of can't ignore it, you know? Um, I mean, I also worry about Facebook and the other guys because they're also, thank you, Jetta. 
Um, Elon Musk, Jesus. I mean, Elon Musk, let's face it. I mean, thank you, Heather. And I'm, this is not an excuse for China. This is a second issue we should be worried about. You know, Elon Musk having um, all of Ukraine's Starlink data scares the hell out of me, you know? I mean, is he providing everything to the Russians? Who knows? This guy, right? So in any case, but but I will admit, I don't, I just don't know enough about the details of the of the concern about TikTok. I mean, Dawn is saying US TikTok data is stored on Google servers in the US, but ByteDance in China may be able to access. Well, that was part of the issue was supposedly there was like this, this firewall where the Chinese couldn't access the American data, but then we found out they are, or they were, thank you, Addy, for the hearts there. Then we found out they were accessing the American data that, that we were told they couldn't access. So it's a lot of, you know, like, um, so that's my take on it. I mean, obviously, I would prefer they don't ban it. Um, I'm hoping that the U.S. makes enough of a threat that TikTok takes it seriously and basically fixes whatever the problem is and is able to put enough of a firewall between you know, TikTok USA and TikTok China or ByteDance or whatever the hell it's called in China to, uh, to keep it separate, you know? Um, but it's a little, you know, yeah, it's a little concerning. It's a little concerning. Um, what else we got here? What else we got here? Um, just looking to see other questions here on YouTube. Um, well, that's interesting. Rob Wall is asking about the weather. How do you think the coming spring thaw and mud will affect both sides bogged down for a while, like in the fall, good or bad for Bakhmut? I mean, overall, overall, winter was good and a problem. Winter overall, I think people were saying was a problem for Ukraine and Russia, that things were going to slow down. Initially, it was because everything was 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 rainy and, and muddy and also freezing cold, but still wet and you know wet and cold. So, so the soldiers would freeze. That was the initial concern. Then, I think several weeks ago, it things finally froze over in Ukraine, right? So people have been able to move around much better. Um, then you've got the issue of the thaw happening. I think the latest I saw somebody say was things should be thawing in Ukraine in mid, now probably depends where in Ukraine, but mid-March. The thaw, again, makes it very difficult to get around. You know, you can't get around there's well Casey's saying there's water in the trenches now um everything becomes wet and muddy and your vehicles can't get around you know your tanks every it's very hard for anything to get around so that can slow things down a lot thank you Timothy um uh, I mean for Bakhmut I would think for Bakhmut for the defenses this is just my gut my gut but military folks out there maybe weigh in if you're defending weather that makes weather, W-E-A-T-H-E-R, that makes it difficult for you to move, like muddy ground is hard for soldiers to walk through. It's hard for vehicles to go over, okay? If that's the case, then muddy ground would be pretty good for defenders. Now, defenders have to sit in the mud. That's not good. But the other guys, the Russians are the ones that have to advance. They have to move towards you. And for them to move towards you, they've got to get through the mud. And if the mud is that hard to get through, maybe that's helpful. That's my only guess as far as how it might affect places like Bakhmut. But my guess is, um, okay, Popo is saying the same thing. That's a bad thing, but yes, good for defenders. That's my thought is it kind of basically... Think about what happened this win the, in the fall with, when things were wet in the winter. They said it was going to kind of freeze, not to use the word freeze, but hold things in place because it's hard to move. So in essence, it could kind of slow things down. Now, my question, actually, if any Ukrainians out there, anybody who's up on Ukrainian weather, when does that rainy season go until? In other words, when does Ukrainian land start to thick? Because think about this true. The Russians invaded February 24th and the Russians at least that first month, the Russians had invaded, you know, more, I mean, I'm doing this vaguely, but down to here, down to here, they were, they were in this area here. I mean, the Russians had invaded a lot, even though it was the rainy, muddy season, right? They did. Um, this part, I don't remember. I think it was a little later. I don't remember when the, uh, the Russians moved in and took over the rest of this, Right. 
Really, in March, at least in the Orsons, where they moved in and then they botched the entire thing. So there is that. They weren't able to get supplies. That stuck a lot too. Yeah, and their supplies got stuck too, remember? So, you know, James is saying mud season is drone season. Um, yeah, I mean, I would think mud season meaning, well, actually, that's true too. Uh, Big Gator Girl, I'm assuming mud season, if people start to get stuck, the drones tell the vehicle stuff stuck, artillery go bomb the, you know, go bomb the hell out of them. Um, saying Ukraine must get uh, all the military support it needs, or basically till mid-April if they want to win. Well, I mean, I think in general, in general, obviously, Ukraine's trying to get everything they can. Um, oh, thank you, CMC. Appreciate that. Um, you know, as soon as they can. I did see a report today. The only thing is it came from the Russians. So, you know, um, folks are saying it's buffering a little on tick on YouTube. So I hope that's not a problem. Thank you, Purnell, for that, for the for the pay mom surprise. Um, but I saw a report that the Russians were claiming in eastern Ukraine that they already saw a couple leopard tanks on the ground, that the Ukrainians already had some German leopard tanks there, um, which would be pretty cool if they already got them into eastern Ukraine. So that's pretty cool. Um, we did talk about the drones earlier, basically just to tell folks, though it looks like the Ukrainians fired about, uh, fired or whatever, sent 12 drones into 12 different Russian cities overnight, which was pretty wild. They may have done some damage. It looks like there was damage of an oil refinery or something in one town. Um, it's not clear whether the Ukrainians intended to do much damage or whether this was a trial run that basically they were uh, attempting they were trying to see, basically, they were testing, trying to coordinate multiple numbers of drones at the same time, going after multiple targets, um, and possibly for a future attack, which would be pretty wild if they go over, you know, if they go over other stuff. So, um, Otan Bot, have you heard about the leaked Kremlin strategy document? Yes. Yes, that allegedly shows how Belarus will be merged with, merged with Russia politically, economically, and militarily by 2030. Yes, that story came out last week. Um, that, that uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, they can try. I mean, it's not clear the Belarusian people are going to be very happy about it. You know, um, the, the people and the, I mean, it's a dictatorship. The military seems that, the, for example, the dictatorship, the dictator Lukashenko um, is worried about the military. He's worried about um, um, them opposing going into the war with Ukraine, which is interesting because you think like a dictator, you're in control of the military, but there seems to be a little bit of wiggle room there. He's worried about the people. So I would think the Ukrainian people and probably the military, neither of them wants to join Russia. Certainly the people don't want to join Russia. The military, I don't know. Um I'm not, I think that's probably aspirational on the part of the Russians. The question is whether they could do it by force. You know, who knows? Um, let's look on TikTok for another question here. And then maybe we'll do a, uh, we'll do a, someone was, someone's texting me. I did a, uh, well, we'll talk later about it. Q&A, Q&A, Q&A. Um, I don't know. This is a, Really good question. I've not gotten a straight answer. Annie is asking, does the Wagner group, which is the mercenary group, pull this off here, take orders from Russian command and control and do they fight alongside Russian soldiers? I mean, we know, we know they're fighting with Russian soldiers in the same area. Like supposedly, supposedly the Russian troops, the Russian, meaning the Russian, uh, you know, military troops, were firing artillery at Bakhmut at the same time the the Wagner groups were on the ground, supposedly. Um, as far as the chain of command, I've never seen anything explaining how that works exactly. Um, I, I believe, I was just going to say two different command structures. I believe it's what I had read said it doesn't go through the Ministry of Defense, I think. Um, the only thing I never understood was does that mean it goes straight to Putin or who does it go to, right? I don't, do any of you know, like who does it actually go to though in the end? Okay, but then who who ultimately, Putin has got to be in control, but does it go like Putin Prigozhin and then some general in in, Bach, in, uh, in Wagner? That's the, that's the thing I've never seen anybody write up. 
I mean, Putin, right? All right, nobody's saying. Although you guys are always a little behind on, it's always about seven, eight seconds behind on TikTok. Um, most likely Putin, FSB. See, that's the thing. I, I would love to see a story. Yeah, but Shoigu? I mean, is Shoigu even involved, right? Shoigu's the minister of defense. Is he? I mean, you know, is he is he part of the chain of command for Wagner? I don't know, you know? Well, and who's paying Wagner is a good question too, right? Is the government paying Wagner? Is Wagner using the money that it's gotten from other? I, I don't know that we know, but I've not seen sort of a really in-depth thing with that. Um, now, Andy is saying there was a clip between Russian and Wagner soldiers arguing over who was in charge of an area. Ah, no, that's interesting. That's interesting. Okay, that's good. That is good. I mean, we know that there's been a lot of this between the Wagner mercenaries and the uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense soldiers. They hate each other. Um, last week, the Ministry of Defense stopped providing artillery ammunition to the to the Wagner troops because they were so pissed at them, which is great. But nonetheless, I don't know whether they're actually on the ground working side by side or whether it's literally, for example, Wagner was doing Bakhmut. And the only thing I'd heard was the Russian troops were perhaps shooting artillery, but that was about it. Um, sorry, Prexis is weighing in. Oh, excuse me. Prexis is weighing in on the Belarus thing. I think Russia's strategy for Belarus would be to offer Lukashenko, the dictator, a position like Kadyrov got, who's the, uh, the Chechen dictator. Um, and the Russian military would move in to back the transition into Russia during the takeover. That's the thing. The Russian military would have to come in and can the Russian military afford to do that? And, you know, I don't know Belarus. Could they really pull it off? Why is the Belarusian president in China? My guess is he's the dictator. My guess is the Chinese are trying to stick it to the U.S. and say, you know, you shot down our balloon. Now you're threatening our companies. Now you're threatening us because of aid to, you know, possible aid to Russia. We're going to start sucking up to the other evil dictators. That, that's my guess. Be nice to us. That's my guess. All right. Maybe one or two additional questions, and then we'll call it, we'll call it quits here. Um, the head of Wagner Group is recruiting. They're still recruiting. Interesting. Interesting. Um, oh, and they're talking about whiskey over on YouTube, of course. <laughs> Let me look for one more uh, TikTok question. Um, and then we'll go. I'm tired. Tonight. I don't know why I'm tired tonight. Um, deet, 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 deet. Yes, some of them have been. Um, Skipper is asking, have the drones been purchased that we are raising money for? Yes. Been. Vlad did a video on TikTok earlier that I will just show you briefly. Uh, showing some on Vlad's now Vlad's TikTok, Vlad, who's the guy that works with us in Ukraine, his TikTok is Nap Naprikov, basically his last name but shortened. So N A P as in Paul, R I K V as in Victor. So on TikTok, maybe one of the mods can write it on on TikTok as I say this. N A N is in Nancy, A P as in Paul, R I K V as in Victor. Okay. And Vlad put up a quick little video, which I will show you showing uh, some of the drones being delivered three days ago. Hold on. You can... Oh, that's going to be, I can't just, oh, turn off the music. All right. YouTube gets mad about the music. We don't want to do that. So this apparently, I guess is that actually this is Bakhmut area. I, I'll bet you, he didn't actually say, I think this is, this might be Bakhmut. Oh, so these are the soldiers with the packs of drones. So that was it. He sent basically two photos at this point, but of some of the soldiers getting the drones. So yeah, it started. It started, which is good. Um, I forgot. I think some of them they're ordering, not some of them. They're much cheaper if they order them from outside of Ukraine. Thank you, Carlos. They're much cheaper if they order them from outside of Ukraine. So it kind of depends on the urgency of it. Do they order it from outside? Maybe it takes a week to get there or do they just buy it really expensive in Ukraine? And, you know, so, but in any case, they're already buying them. Yeah. So Excellent. So thank you guys for helping with that, by the way. All right. Um, thank you for the gift, Hazel. All right. Let me do a quick recap because I feel like we're going slower now anyway. So it's a good time to call it quits. There you go. Naprakov. Uh, is that, there's, his, there's his TikTok. Yeah, Naprakov. Actually, do follow him on TikTok. We're trying to get Vlad's followers up. 
He does post uh, cool videos occasionally, occasionally, often, I should say, <laughs> occasionally. Um, so please do follow him. Vlad's a good guy. And like I said, he's been helping us from the beginning with all of our uh, humanitarian aid and some of the military aid too, actually. Um, all right, let me... Um, let me do the quick summary of the stories we covered today, and then I will call it quits until tomorrow. You guys can find us, as always, Wednesday, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time U.S., so tomorrow I'll be back at 6 p.m. Eastern to talk about the latest news. Oh, but do check out, oh, I forgot to mention the biggest news. So the, the reason I was mentioning our auction earlier tonight on Discord is because this is the final box of Russian plane parts. This was a Russian fighter jet shot down over Ukraine. It's the final auction because tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, this box's auction is done. So that's why I, I wanted to mention that it's the, this is it for these guys. Oops. <laughs> and I got to figure out how to close the box, but I'll worry about that later. So just be aware of that. Um, oops. Oops. Um, all right, let me do a quick summary. So a massive Ukrainian drone attack on Russian to Russia today targeted 12 different Russian cities uh, in Bakhmut. Ukraine says they're sending more troops. Ukrainian troops say the situation is much worse than reported. But at the same time, um, it looks like a Ukrainian soldier basically said that they're fighting in Bakhmut to keep the Russians busy while the Ukrainians prepare for the counteroffensive in the spring. That's my summary. Uh, Putin signed a law today suspending Russia's participation in the New START nuclear uh, nuclear arms control treaty. Uh, Zelensky may have fired one of his senior military commanders in order to generate fresh ideas, according to Sky News. Um, a little bit more on that Russian AWACS air, uh, what is it, an air reconnaissance plane, radar plane, that it looks like Belarusian partisans may have attacked on Sunday. Um, there was a satellite photo released that showed what might be damage on the plane, which would be good news. There was another hack. Oh, thank you for the gift there, Bonnie. There was another hack of Russia's civil defense network today um, where basically they broadcast on TV channels and radio that Russia was under missile attack, which I find funny, but also a little scary. Um, the chairman of Russia's Human Rights Council has called for a new law banning, Rus making making criminal Russophobia, <laughs> the the irrational fear of Russians. These people. Um, CNN says that the U.S. has not found any evidence that weapons it has provided to Ukraine have been found outside of Ukraine. And pro-Ukrainian activists in Crimea are running around and spray painting the Russian Z symbol that the Russians are putting everywhere. And they're taking the Z and finishing it with a Z the other way, making it an hourglass, right? Like, like the hourglass on the back of a Black Widow spider, painting it blue and yellow for Ukraine with the message, your time is up, you know, or your time is coming. So in other words, the clock is ticking which is a, I just love that because it's a wonderful kind of nasty psychological weapon and taking the Russians own sort of propaganda and turning it around on them is just great. All right. Um, I am going to get going here. Um, and, uh, thanks guys for joining us. Thank you for your gifts. As always, you guys were crazy generous. Um, especially that, that Phoenix. Oh my God. Thank you for that. But thank you all really. Uh, thanks for going after the, I always feel like romper room here. Thank you for going after the moderators. Um, something's going on, on CNN. Anything good you guys are saying on CNN? Um, Vlad's, TikTok, uh, Vlad's TikTok account is, what did we say? N-A-P-R-K-V, I think. Do you guys have it still handy? Was it N-A-P-R-K-V? I can look again. Oop, here it is. Um, oops. N A P R I K V. Okay. N A P R I K V. There you go. Manda Bear has it correct. That's Vlad's TikTok. Go, go follow Vlad on TikTok if you would. He's a good guy. CNN's talking about Ukraine. Okay. I will go put it on after this. Um, well, you could, you're on TikTok. Just go look at Vlad's account. <laughs> you can just go check it out. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Um, Discord, you know, I'll go to Discord for a few minutes. I'm just tired. I don't know why I'm so tired, uh, but I'll go to Discord for a little bit. We ha I haven't hung out on Discord yet this week. It's Tuesday. So let's go to Discord for a little bit. And um, on Discord, remember, once you get there, go all the way down. John's the voice channels. Look for John's after party. I'll be in the after party and make sure to bid on our new auctions we've got and those Russian fighter jet 
parts that were shot down over Ukraine. That auction's done tomorrow at 1130 Eastern. Woo-woo. All right, guys. See you tomorrow. I'll see you at Discord as well. All right. Good night, guys.